Hello, welcome to this episode of What's Going On in the Suez. Uh, I am Sal Mercagliano. I'm an associate professor of history at Campbell University and a former merchant mariner. I think I should explain something a little bit more too. Uh, I went to the State University of New York Maritime College. That's one of the six maritime schools, colleges, academies across the United States that trains uh, merchant mariners, those who sail on board ships like the Ever Given. Uh, so I did that. Uh, I sailed for three years as a deck officer, the guys up on the bridge. Uh, the other groups are usually engineers down in the engine room. Uh, and then I worked ashore for four years overseeing uh, the operations of a fleet of vessels. Uh, then I stopped sailing after seven years and uh, I got a master's in maritime history and nautical archaeology from East Carolina University and a PhD uh, in military naval history from the University of Alabama. I'm just trying to tell you my background so you know where I come from in, in talking about this and who I am, not just some history professor who's talking about a ship stuck in the Suez. So anyway, I uh, posted uh, a thread on my Twitter feed today. And if you don't follow me on Twitter, it's at Mercogliano S, M-E-R-C-O-G-L-I-A-N-O-S. And I thought I'd talk about the vessel, uh, the Ever Given today, because I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Uh, she's a fairly new vessel. She was uh, laid down in 2015 in a shipyard in Japan. Uh, there's three big shipbuilders right now, uh, Japan, Korea, and China. Uh, and uh, those are the places where you see these big vessels built. 90% of all vessels in the world today are built in those three countries. Uh, and uh, she's one of 11 uh, of what's called a golden class of uh, uh, container ships. Uh, and the vessel, I, I want to kind of put you into context why these vessels have gotten so big and so large. So in 2011, Maersk Lines announced the construction of what was called the Triple E class. Uh, and this was a big evolution in container ships, really the beginning of what we see as the ultra large container vessels. Uh, Maersk put them out there, these triple th E's we're talking about, uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, efficiency and economy. Those were the, what they called the triple E. Uh, built 20 of them and then they built 11 more which were even bigger. And there was a huge media blitz on this too. I got to say Maersk went overboard on this. They, they wanted to let the world know what they were doing with these vessels, 400 meters long. Uh, the original Triple E's were just under 19,000 uh, TEUs, we'll talk about in a second. And uh, the, the latter Triple E's, the 11 bigger ones were over 20,000 and everything. So they had a huge media blitz. There's an entire discovery series on the, on the vessel and the construction. And, and my favorite thing about what they did with it was this. Uh, this is the Lego version of the Maersk Triple E. This is it right here. Look at that bad boy. It's pretty good. Pretty, pretty awesome. I would love to tell you that this is my son's, 12-year-old uh, son's uh, uh, version, but it's not. It's mine. Uh, giving away something here on, on today's edition here of what's going on in the Suez. Uh, but that ship, and I'm going to use actually use that in a second for a uh, model for something because I want to talk about this. Uh, these ships have gotten bigger and bigger, and the Suez Canal has accommodated them. 2015, they enlarged the canal, and they've made the canal big enough so you can handle these ultra-large uh, container ships. And one of the things about these container ships is that they are so large, they're, they're, they're literally so big, that it becomes very difficult uh, to maneuver them in very confined spaces. And one of those confined spaces is the Suez Canal. But I want to talk about the size of the vessel, because again, this is the thing that gets everyone. I've been see, receiving lots of uh, notes from people with ideas of how to get the vessel free and everything. But I don't think we all appreciate really what we're talking about here in, in, in the size of this vessel. Uh, these things are behemoths. And you get these little comparisons here, as like you see on the slide right here, with uh, you know where it lines up with the Pyramid of Giza and the Eiffel Tower and the Empire State Building. And everybody loves doing those things. They're, they're, they're great for that. Uh, but one of the things I think we, we, we tend to miss here is, is exactly uh, the, the scope and scale of this. So if you want background on, on the size of this vessel, this vessel, all vessels have to be classified. And that means there's an agency out there that puts the vessel, what we call in class. They're the, the agency that goes out there and makes sure that the vessel is meeting all the requirements to ensure it's a safe operating vessel. And you could be sitting there going, well, what, why do I need a classification? You can't go in and out of ports unless your vessel's classified. There's only a certain number of classifying agents out there. Ever Given is classified under ABS, the American Bureau of Shipping. Uh, and this goes to the international nature of maritime shipping. 
Uh, Evergreen, the company that owns Evergiven, is a Taiwanese company. Uh, the operating company for this firm, uh, BSR, is a German company. The owner is Japanese. The crew is Indian. Uh, and they're in the Egyptian waters with an Egyptian pilots on board. So it gives you an idea of this, the, 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 the confluence of international elements here that are involved. Uh, this site right here, the ABS site, uh, www.eagle.org, uh, has the ABS information on it. And you can type in the ship's name or their IMO number. IMO is the International Maritime Organization. Every vessel has an IMO number. It's kind of like a serial number because there are vessels out there with the uh, same number. So they make sure about it. And it has all the things in here. It has the, uh, the vessel's class number, its IMO number, its flag. It's, it's flagged in Panama. That's another element right there. You got the Panamanians involved. And it, her call sign, which has caused controversy for some ridiculous reason, H3RC, and, 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 and people are like Hillary Rodden Clinton. It's just, that is completely randomly generated. Can I be clear? It's just, it, it's, 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 and if you're gonna do a conspiracy, why would you put your name on it? I just, anyway. All the information is here on the vessel. And one of the things you start to see in here is information like when it was laid down, it was laid down in 2015, uh, December, December 25th of uh, 2015. Uh, and she was launched in May of 2018 and delivered in September of 2018, which is really amazing. Uh, you're talking about less than three years to build these ships. Uh, HMM built the biggest group of ships, these 24,000 box vessels uh, in Korea. And they built them and delivered them, all of them, all. 12 in in two years it's it, it's insane how fast they build these vessels and they build these vessels modularly i should tell you what they do is they build these vessels in blocks i'm gonna use my model here for a second so if you notice like where the cells are on here actually the vessel itself is built in these modules and what they would do is build the vessel in slices almost like if you take this vessel and you would chop it down in slices that's how they build them and then what they do is they build them in different areas and then float them because they will float into a large dry dock and then assemble them together. So this builds vessels built in pieces. And that's a process, by the way, that was uh, innovative in the United States. Uh, it was being done uh, actually before World War I, this pre-assembly areas along the Delaware River uh, in the United States. We use it during World War I. It's used, prefabrication is used like crazy during World War II. They built all those Liberty ships uh, during World War II. And after World War II, nearly every shipyard overseas that had been destroyed because of World War II adopts prefabrication. Ironically, we don't. Uh, our prefabrication yards go away because they were hastily built during World War II. They're not the big traditional shipyards. Uh, one of the reasons we lag in, in, in uh, shipping in the United States right now. Anyway, back to the Ever Given. So all this information is on here. You can see all the details here about her. Uh, some of the things to be aware of, and I'll, I'll highlight just a couple of things on here as we go through here. So for example, uh, I'm gonna go down the left side first and I'll come back to it here. So you'll see design uh, dead weight right there, 199,000, uh, almost 200,000 tons. Dead weight is how much you can carry. It's how much you can physically carry. Weight you can put inside the vessel. Gross tonnage, that's actually not tonnage. That's actually volume. Uh, gross tonnage came in of, uh, again, go back to history, Basically, a ton was it was was basically the uh, a barrel, a barrel of or a bale of commodities, and what a what a what a gross ton is is forty cubic feet. It's actually a measure of volume. Uh, she's designed for twenty thousand ton, uh, twenty thousand TEUs. Now let's talk about the TEUs for a second because I think it's really important to understand these uh, the TEUs here for a second. So my model does not show you all the TEUs that are on a vessel. So for example, right here, we'll show you the back end, the stern side, get you some nautical lingo right here. This is the, the stern side of this vessel right here. And these actually pop out, I'm gonna pop these out here. And what you see here is a series of blocks kind of, and, and, and actually Lego blocks are very akin to containers in many ways. One of the problems you'll have with removing the containers is issues we'll talk about here. These are only six across on my model. They are only six across right there. I'm upset with Lego for not going truly accurate in my model. I don't know if I can get my money back from Lego. But to give you a, a, an idea here, let's look at, that's the stern of Ever Given right there. That, and it shows you the boxes. You'll see they're broken up into kind of four little groups right there. And if you look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 across. 23 across. 
So you got 23 containers. Now, each container, I should tell you, I said this, this vessel can carry 20,000 containers. That's 20,000 20 foot containers. Most of the containers you see on these vessels, if I give you the side profile right there, most of those containers you see are 40 foot containers. So even though you say it's a 20,000 box ship, those are 20 foot, what they call TEUs, 20 foot equivalent units. In FEU, a 40 foot equivalent union is, is two TEU. So if you load your vessel with all FEUs, it, you can only carry half that amount. Now you can't do that because some of the mod, some of the spaces are fit for 20 units, especially up in the bow and everything. So you'll you'll see that. The other image here is to look from uh, above. This image here from above. Let me zoom in here a little bit for you on this one. This is the image of the vessel stuck, and I think it's one of the best images, by the way, of the vessel right there. It gives you a clear indication. You can actually see all the silt and sand right here, thrown up by the vessel right here. And if you look, these are the rows. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in front of the bridge. So you have seven. This is the bridge structure right here. You have the bridge structure right here. Uh, the bridge on these vessels, again, come back over to here. The bridge structure has to be so tall so you can literally see over the bow of the vessel. One of the problems these vessels have is you can't see anything directly under the bow. Anything directly in front of the vessel, there's a huge blind spot on these vessels. So very difficult to see. One of the things you would do in a Suez Canal transit is put somebody up on the bow. A lot of these vessels now have cameras up there too, so you can see it on the bridge. Uh, what, what's not known in the Suez Canal, which is very funny, is you have to mount what's called a Suez Canal light. Uh, uh, vessels, uh, uh, when you ride on a vessel at night, for example, there's no lights forward of the bridge. You, you operate in pure darkness. Uh, you'll have some red lights for like monitors and radar scopes, but you operate in pure darkness. You have no lights on at all. Uh, the Suez doesn't operate that because you got so much light from the shore and everything like that. They actually put a big headlight on the vessel. It's called the Suez Canal light. It actually floats. It's a big metal cauldron it comes out. You have a uh, what's called a bull nose in the nose in the bow of the vessel. You send a cable down. You hoist it up, and then there's a plug, the Suez Canal light plug. You open it up and you plug it in there, and boom, you can turn your big huge headlight on on the bow. Anyway, back to the containers. A little tidbit of information there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right there. Oh, actually, take it. It's two, four, six, eight. I'm a historian, not a mathematician. Apologize. Eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 19, 20, 22, 24. 24 rows there. Those are 24 rows of, of, of 40 foot containers right there. 24. And, and so that begins to give you an idea of the scope and scale. I should also mention that when you look at this vessel here, all you're seeing are the containers above the waterline. There are still containers below the waterline. You're seeing stacks here that are two, four, six, seven. Uh, so about seven high right there. They're usually about 21 high, 21 high. If you go down into the interior of the vessel, you'll have uh, uh, containers below the waterline. This vessel draws 14.5 meters of water. And that means it's about 47 feet. It's a ridiculous amount of water this thing draws. Uh, it won't be uniform throughout the vessel. You'll obviously have less uh, containers at the bow and also at the stern. So one of the things you'll notice back here is there's another house back here and same thing here on the model. You have a uh, house back here on the stern where the stacks are, but that's because that's where the engine room is. One of the things that you see in these modern ships as opposed to kind of old fashioned ships in many ways is the engines are placed as far back aft as you can, as far back aft as you can. This way, this whole middle of the vessel is basically nothing but containers between basically the engine room and all the way up to the bow right here. It's nothing but containers in there, just stacks and stacks of containers. <clears throat> you try to get as many in there as you can, uh, which makes the container ships very interesting because they're very buoyant in the middle. Uh, one of the things that container ships tend to do, get my model again here for you, one of the things that container ships tend to do, there's two motions on a vessel uh, that they suffer. It's called hogging and sagging. Sagging is exactly what it sounds like. You sag in the middle. The, the two ends are up high, the middle sags. Container ships tend to do the, the opposite. They tend to be very stiff vessels. Uh, and what they tend to do is called hog. Their ends droop. In other words, the bow and stern are lower than the middle. Uh, and that's a natural tendency because of the nature of these vessels. They're so buoyant in the middle. There's so much buoyancy because of their, their shape and nature and their weight. The bow and stern tends to uh, droop a little bit. So what happens in the case of the Maersk vessel here, let's go over to here for a second. Let's look at this imagery right here. 
This is an image from the BBC here, which shows the, oops, I'm sorry, I went too far there. Let me go back. There we go. Shows the vessel. This vessel is hung up on the bow and stern. This vessel is, is hung up on its bow and stern. And uh, being hung up in the bow and stern means that, number one, that this vessel is not hogging. It, it's either, it's probably stiff. It's very hard for these vessels to sag. If this vessel sags, that's the problem. If she starts to sag, she's going to crack. And, and that's, that's the issue you have. So she tends to be very stiff, a very, very stiff vessel when it comes to that. And the stern is in the mud, although we got a report yesterday that they've been able to free the rudder, they've been able to free the propeller, they said. But the bow, about the first third of the vessel is still on the ground. Matter of fact, there was a report that she shifted a little bit and there's a video with tugs honking and a lot of people like the ship's out, the ship's free. And it's like, no, the vessel moved a little bit. But I, I will tell you, that's not actually a good news in some ways because lo and behold, we found out there's some rocks there too. We know that bulbous bow, again, let's, let's go to this picture here. Let me get out of this and go back over here. This is a picture of her when I believe I got one of her. Yep. This is her basically empty right here. And one of the things you see right here, let me zoom this back out here a little bit. This is her empty right here. You saw the little digger, you know, up there at the bow digging away and you can see part of the red right here in this bulbous bow. You should never see that. That's not something you should see when she's fully loaded down to her marks. She should be just a, just a little bit of a red line showing. Just a little bit of her red line is what we should be seeing on this vessel. And uh, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that right now. She's up there a little high. Let me see if I can find that imagery there for you and everything. There we go. That's the image I was talking about. So you can see how high she is up out of the water. You can see the beginning of the bulbous bow right there. You can see it in here. There's another picture of them excavating out. This area right here is a big void. It's, it's empty. There's nothing in there. There's not supposed to be anything in there. And then further back here is the bow thrusters. She actually has two bow thrusters. She has two bow thrusters. And I'm going to do another video where I talk about what exactly I think happened and how the vessel kind of careened out of control and hit. Uh, you'll notice the anchors are in place. Uh, they never drop their anchors. Uh, that it would do nothing, uh, nothing at all. It, it, it's, it's. I know you've seen movies where anchors are dropped and things get grabbed. That doesn't work. The bow thrusters wouldn't work either. She's going too fast, thirteen knots. But the key thing here is we know she's flooding up here. She's got damage. These vessels are built. You'll hear some people talk about the steel of the vessel. So one of the things that allows you to build these vessels so big is they do amazing engineering on these vessels. The engineering on these vessels are just ridiculous. And one of the things they can do is minimize the thickness of the steel because they know where you need thick steel, where you don't need thick steel. You know, you know think of a house, think of, think, of a, think of a house frame. You know, you don't need a frame of going up and down your house every, every two inches, it's spaced out. That's because that's what your house needs. And you can put a very thin kind of, you know, kind of uh, plywood on the, on the shell of that. The skin of the vessel is not the strength of the vessel at all. It's the framing and it's the inside. They will put thicker steel where they need it. They know where the vessel is going to flex and bend. And that's where they put their thicker steel. But the rest of the steel tends to be just thin enough to get by. And that's all they want to use because they want to make the vessel as light as possible to carry as much as possible. It's not like when you go on, you know, uh, older ships and you see thicker steel. The reason they use thicker steel is because they didn't have the engineering capability or the computers to model this to build lighter vessels. So you have to be worried about the damage done to this vessel. And what we're talking about here is the bulbous bow. So let me go to my model here and zoom in here a little bit for you. So you see right there, that bulbous bow right there, that, that kind of uh, a little kind of point there at the end there. That's what helps you push through the water. That's what helps push you through the water. What she has done when, when she veered out of control here and went hard that way, that bulbous bow became a ram. And what this vessel has basically done is gone into the dirt and then gone up on top of the dirt. And she's sitting on top at this time. And what that means is, if you look at her from kind of above, let's see if I can get you a little above the image. Oops, I'll knock everything over. So if you look at her kind of from above like this, and everything, get her up there. There we go. A little higher there. There we go. So if you see her from above like that, what she has done is as she came in, she pushed the dirt out of her way. She will maneuver the dirt out of the way. And 
because she displaces so much water. I mean, it's over 200,000 tons she displaces. She throws that much dirt out. So a lot of the dredging you've, you've been seeing done, and they'll talk about how many cubic meters of, of, of dredging they've done. That's the dredging to get to the vessel. I mean, it, I mean, it's not like it's flat and she's sitting there with the dirt perfectly level. She's got piles of it up against her. And not only do you have to remove the dirt right alongside of her, but as you pull her out, let's go over here to uh, this, this image right here. As you pull her out, this image from above right here, uh, you know, assume the canal here is, this is north, assume this is 12 o'clock, this is six o'clock. And she's sitting at about maybe about two o'clock right here with the bow and her stern is, is about eight o'clock. You have to clear all this dirt over here out of the way because as you pull her you got to make sure she's she's not going to pull against the dirt you need to get it clear the other problem you have is she's sitting on dirt what you don't want to do is is pull her in the deep water she's got to slide into it you need to get her in there you actually need to get the dirt out from below her and get her down and that's a big problem that's not easy to do is to get that dirt out from underneath it a lot of people are like well just pump water and liquefy and coming out you don't want to loosen areas underneath her. She's being supported underneath. She's got, you know, weight is holding her. And if your weight is only in a few points, you know, if, if it's this one finger holding it right here, if I'm just holding this thing with one finger, that steel is going to puncture and break. And again, you're sitting like, well, so what? So it breaks, Al. That's not a big deal. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a small little problem. It's not because once you break the steel, and we already know it's cracked. We already know that it's flooding in the forepeak and in the bow thruster room. That crack can run. It can run through multiple tanks. And the worst scenario here, well, there's two worst scenarios. Number one, she breaks in half right there. And uh, that's it. The second one is she capsizes because she's dredged out on one side and she rolls to one side. That's the second case. The third case is you get her free. She's right in the middle of the canal and then she sinks. And now you have a huge block ship. Uh, she is so big, you can't even really just pull her over to the side. You've got to get her out of the channel. That's a big problem. She's so wide that you can't just, you know, well, we'll put her on the side there and we'll let other ships go by. You can, but you would be really slow and it'd be a, a, a chore to do it. And it'd be almost impossible for this to work, for that to happen. The other thing that's not talked about enough, and we should mention it, and I think it's in, in, it's in this, this, this uh, image right here. Well, let me, let me show you this and then we'll go to that. So let me stop sharing here. So this model here, what's different about this model, the Maris triple E's is they got these two propellers on the back right there. You'll see it's twin screwed, twin screw vessel. Well, that is expensive. Separate engines uh, is, is, is fairly expensive. In the case of the Ever Given, she's got one engine, one engine. And understand these engines are tremendous in size. They are absolutely huge. So this is the engine room on that Maris Triple E I was talking about, I found the uh, imagery for it. The Ever Given has a slow speed diesel engine, massive slow speed diesel engine, gives it about 22 knots. And I said one propeller. And one of the things that most people don't realize about this vessel, and, and it's a big issue for this vessel, is the vessels don't have reduction gear. In other words, the engine as the engine spins it spins directly tied to the prop the crankshaft is the pop is the prop so when the engine's going up and down and the pistons the the the, the propeller's turning now you're sitting there going wow one engine that seems ridiculous well th these diesel engines are slow speed diesel engines they don't go very fast i mean I, I, she probably spins her prop around 60 90 rpms tops that's probably about as fast as it spins it's a huge massive prop uh but one of the things with that prop is is uh, the, with the engine, excuse me, is you can cut out the cylinders. So you can do work on independent cylinders. They won't be connected into the crankshaft. So you can basically do engine maintenance. It's very rare for the ship to be on all its cylinders at the same time. They're continually doing maintenance on one or two of the cylinders. And that allows them to keep the ship operating all the time until they have to go in the dry dock. Uh, it creates a redundancy. The, the problem with this is this image right here. This image right here is the problem for them. So if this vessel did what we think it did, hit the bow, so the bow's crumpled in, it's compromised. It's sitting on about the first third of the vessel, everything forward of the bridge. I think this is actually not exactly accurate in terms of how much is on the embankment over here. But this side hit, 
Now they said they cleared the dirt out from the rudder and the, the propeller, which rose questions like, well, just kick the engines in. Let's pull it off with the, with the engines. I don't think you can right now. If this vessel was under speed, in other words, it was still under propulsion. It was under speed. There was a debate about this. I said, I've already mentioned this, that the pilot, that the uh, pilots and the agents said they lost power, but the ship says they didn't. They were under full, they were under power and the wind took them. Well, if that prop is spinning and it's spinning for 13 knots, about a little more than half normal speed, that prop came into contact with dirt. Uh, so yes, you would have damage to the prop, but that prop is directly connected to the engine. And the minute that prop came into contact, it would have stopped and that engine would have stopped. And that is a catastrophic issue in the engine room right there. There is no telling the condition of those engines and, and whether or not uh, those engines are in any sort of shape. It also creates a massive amount of stern damage, potentially vibration, whether she's leaking along her shafts, uh, along her stern shaft. Uh, that is an issue they would have to do. They would have to secure that to make sure because the, the, the propeller comes through an opening in the vessel, there's packing around it, this material. It always leaks a little bit, uh, but th that's normal. But if you hit that stern, you'll shake the prop and that could throw off the packing and you could conceivably have a leak. Again, one of the things that we're seeing it here is the Egyptians want this vessel off immediately. But the issue here has got to be a slow, methodical salvage. Now, there was a report from a, a, a reporter at Lloyd's, who I have huge respect for. I, I believe him in a minute. He was saying that they're being very optimistic that she may come off in two to three days, which is great if it is. Uh, hopefully fantastic. That's fantastic news. But I just don't know how much that is a accurate assessment of the salvers. I think they're trying to shoot for that March 31st high tide on the spring tide. Uh, then the tides begin to get less. This vessel is flexing right now. She, she's hung up on both banks and she's flexing. Uh, one of the key things is to get that dirt out from her stern. If they get that dirt out from the stern and the stern's free floating, which I haven't heard them say yet. They said the rudder's free. They said that the propeller's spinning or, or they didn't say the propeller's spinning, but they said the propeller's free, but they haven't said the stern's floating. And again, you come back to this image right here Let's pull this up here. Sorry, I don't have this as well choreographed as, as uh, I probably should. You come back to this image here of her basically across the bank there. Uh, that stern is really close. Now, the, the shallowest part of the canal is the east side. This east side right here where her bow is right here is again, forward of the bridge right there. She's probably on mud right there. She's probably on the mud right there. And people are asking, well, why isn't the whole canal dredged that way? It's hard to do that. It's, it's ridiculously hard to do that uh, because of, of, of just the nature of it. People are asking too, when you're dredging here, why not throw the spoil up here onto the embankment? Why are you putting it back into the Suez? You don't dredge dirt up, you dredge sludge up or slurry up. Uh, and you don't want to put the slurry on the bank because the, the slurry on the bank will, will eat away at the bank. And so you tend not to do that. You can pump it away, but that requires a pumping system. Plus, you're moving up and down the, 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 the uh, canal when you do that. So eventually, they may set up a piping system to do that, to pump this away. But they also don't want to pump Suez Canal water in here into arable land. You can do it over here, but I'm not sure what else is over here. This image doesn't give me a full image. I'd have to look at the Google Earth to see what's around, whether you really want to start pumping salt water uh, into land that could be arable and, and used for other purposes and contaminate it. So I think that's an issue that we don't see enough of right now. The rest of the ABC, ABS, excuse me, ABS information is all here for you to look at. And again, I think it, there's some interesting uh, elements in here to look at on the, on the configuration of the vessel, uh, the size of the vessel. Again, it's just the, the, the space here is just amazing when you start thinking about her tonnage. You'll see on here a Suez gross tonnage. Uh, the Suez Canal calculates a unique tonnage for every vessel. Certain spaces are counted, others aren't. And they use that tonnage to figure out your toll when you go through the canal, how much they charge you. And then you'll see fresh water capacity. She has uh, basically about uh, uh, 512 tons of water, uh, 13,437 tons of fuel oil, 104 tons of lube oil. That's the kind of stuff they can pump off very quickly if they need to. But again, they don't want this vessel to move until the salvers are ready for it to move. Shifting isn't always a great move. It wasn't a great move. There was a report in G Captain today that she's on that big rock. And so you really want to be careful with that. So the scope and scale of this vessel is absolutely unique. 
And I'll include the links to this ABA, ABS site in my video uh, so you can see it. I also include a video from uh, Richard Hammond's big, Richard Hammond of, 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 of the UK, of uh, the uh, Top Gear and the Grand Tour and everything. But he does about a seven minute video where he's climbing through one of the Maersk E-Class vessels. And I think it's a great video to watch because it'll really give you the scope and scale of what is entailed uh, in this in this vessel, you'll really begin to to appreciate it. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, again, uh, if you like the videos uh, and and you want uh, further updates, which we're going to have, uh, just subscribe to my channel. Uh, you know, click the bell so you know when the new video is posted. Give it a thumbs up. It's always fun to to see who people like the video and everything like that. Feel free to comment uh, and uh, follow me on on Twitter uh, for more updates as they come along. And everything. I've had a whirlwind week here doing a lot of uh, new shows and, and everything and, and uh, very humbled by the fact that I have an opportunity to talk about this. Uh, I bring together an experience in shipping in maritime history uh, and in vessel construction. So I bring a, a lot of things together all at the same time. I teach uh, maritime policy so I know the current industry. So uh, I'm in a very unique place to, to do this. So anyway, uh, any questions at all, please let me know. Thanks.